Happy Monday, y'all. Dude, I loved that build-up to the solo of the Bryce Science Computer uh, calculation <laughs> sound. <laughs> That's all I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. How are you guys? That's a good bit. The three of us. The three of us. Welcome to Night Attack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I know Andrew sent you guys the stories. I don't know if you actually got a chance to look at them or not. I, I no. It's probably uh, okay if not. I try to do you the service <laughs> of not sure. corrupting my opinions in advance. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's in the fresh moment that the magic is made. <laughs> so, uh, I've prepared by not preparing. Perfect. Ju uh, us and Larry King, like uh, <laughs> Larry King, like Wait, unironically. Yeah, no, he never he's, reads he's, cards. Uh, yeah, he said. Uh, he said, uh, you know, I don't read the books because I want to come to it with the perspective that the audience has, knowing nothing. Well, which is like that's a good way to not have to read someone's book <laughs> before right. interviewing them. <laughs> Uh yeah no uh, let's let's go let's get let's All get right. weird Andrew's on a flight he's coming back from uh, New York City where he not only New attended York the Thriller Awards but also avoided the blackout miraculously. Mm. I missed all that stuff. I I only saw it was it was one of those things where I only saw the reaction on Twitter, but I didn't see like the the story that New York went down. And they went down to. Well, I don't know if it went down to Chinatown. I just Chinatown. literally, I, I realized that the metaphor was going <laughs> to have literal implications. All right, well then let's let's get weird things started. How about that? Let's yeah. go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Weird Things. I'm your host, as always, Bryce Castillo, joined with Justin Robert Young. Oh, hello. And Brian Brushwood. Ah, oh, same as always. As we as it always is. No, uh, Andrew's Andrew's on a flight, so uh, he's sent... sorry. Who? Uh, oh, you know, don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, we've got some stories here from, from beyond the grave, uh, including... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to believe like there's, there's a beyond the grave newsletter, and it's nothing but what's happening to all the other corpses in your local graveyard. It's just like, uh, more worms, attack! <laughs> David is decomposing I, over here. Yeah, if it was just like really breathless tech reviews of like hot new coffins. <laughs> or, or the uh, 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 kind of like in Beetlejuice, where it's like the obituaries are. Let's welcome new tenant so and so. Yeah, <laughs> Let's exactly. give him a housewarming gift. <laughs> Classified <laughs> section in the back. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let, let's start off, kind of, kind of in weird things tradition. We got some Elon Musk news. Uh, it was announced uh, a couple days ago that Elon Musk's Neuralink project would finally tell everybody what they're doing. Uh, on a live stream tomorrow, uh, July 16, as we record this. You know what's funny is I realized after the sentence was completed, what you meant was Neuralink would reveal what the company Neuralink had been up to. Yeah. What I yeah. heard was that Neuralink will finally tell the users of Neuralink uh, what they've been doing. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, like they'll attach it to your brain uh, and be like, you're procrastinating, yeah. man. You're, you're harboring deep-seated resentments against your father. Uh. You, you, uh... <laughs> so uh, if, if you don't know, Neuralink is uh, a new venture. Uh, not, not that new. It's been around since 2016 from Elon Musk. The idea being to create, uh, I don't know, use, usable neural lace technology to create an interface between human brains and technology and hardware. Yeah, it's it's been sort of a, a superposition Schrodinger's cat situation whenever I read news stories on this over the last 20 or 30 years because mm -hmm. I would read one news story that breathlessly said, uh, the, uh, you can control a robotic arm with your brain. Right. It's like having a real arm. And then the other one will say, uh, if you think of a math problem, you can make a cursor go up one notch and and sure. it's not clear to me at all the you know the the, the state of the art in that technology mm -hmm. and uh forgive me and i could say this because uh, uh there's never been andrew main on this show right uh forgive me if i am a little bit suspect that elon musk might breathlessly announce things <laughs> slightly sure. uh uh ahead of schedule yeah and but, but the one thing that we can say is that the only reason why we are talking about this now is because when elon musk no matter what his record is in terms of putting things out on the street because of tesla and spacex being viable his his rando projects will get more like right now in Silicon Valley, there's a billion rich guys who are very smart and they give billions of dollars to people to work on these projects. And they are currently vying for your attention 
right now and you are not giving it to them. Uh, mm. For whatever reason, Elon Musk has, uh, uh, no matter how much we like to, and in fact, probably because we can nitpick his release schedule down to like, oh, well, you promised this and it didn't come out till then, uh, that we're like, oh, okay, well, this probably has, whatever they say is happening here, has a better than average chance of actually happening compared to uh, some, you know, whatever, the, the, the third founder of LinkedIn who really wants to have drone uh, sure. stock cars or something like that. So uh, how long has sort of this, because on this show, you know, all, all three slash four of us have watched over time SpaceX go from an idea to a reality, right? Over what, five, maybe 10 years? Uh, well, certainly the aspect of reusable rockets, which was talked about, you know, as you know, 10 years ago, uh, right. and, and even, I guess, talked about even before that. So I guess before they give, you know, it, uh, whatever they say they announce tomorrow will, will I'm sure be another long-term goal in the same way of like the boring company had the very big concept video. And now as it becomes closer to reality, there are more physical details being, being decided. What do you think the long-term goal with Neuralink is? I mean, uh, well, 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 uh, or what are some of the uses, I guess, of this technology for people who aren't trying to control prosthetics or, you know, who are using it for accessibility? Like, do you think there's a consumer use? for this? Well, I, I, at the very least, think about this. Um, you ever, you ever have that feeling that your thoughts are going too fast for your fingers to type stuff out? I mean, imagine everything from writing novels, like, like you just think, and, and maybe like you have this gestalt blueprint for a story and it, it gets enough of the word cloud of the nonsense as your brain races mm -hmm. that it at least kind of puts it all down. And then when you do sit down to write the novel, you're editing, not writing. And we've talked sure. about this before on After Things, where it's like the best advice I ever got when it came to writing a book is turn off your monitor because we tend to edit as we write. And I know some people like uh, like the late, great Andrew Maine could do that, um, uh, but, but most of us cannot. We have to separate it into two different jobs. Yeah. So the ability to sort of download this gestalt. And then on top of that, I, I remember, it, it seems like it would be a two-way street, right? If you could read mm -hmm. sort of the, the, the total visualization, think about this, you could record your dreams you could, um, uh, and long after your brain has scrubbed it, uh, because that's nonsense, sure. you could go back and review it as, a, and, and in fact, there could be uh, dreams as a service where Ugh. they record your dreams, you forget them, mm -hmm. but then every day- They remember for us wholesale. Well, well, well you, you, get a, you get a report where it's like, hey, here's the dream you had. These are the high points. Uh, uh, these are the bullet points. Um, in general, psychoanalysts have said blah, 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 which is all you know kind of voodoo anyway, but- yeah, I don't know. Like, like, uh, uh, certainly, you know, you, you read stuff like when you dream about spiders, it means one thing. And then you read that and you're like, oh my God, that's definitely been on my mind. Hmm. So I, I don't know. Okay. That's, that's the kind of far out there stuff I can imagine. <laughs> Just so what do you think? So Brian, you've, you've worked it up to the point where we can have more of an application for what your dreams mean books. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, we can now sell more of these books. I, I would be really surprised to hear the argument for what about humanity's progress oh, would no. indicate that we would ever get away from that. So of we clearly course. love no, that. But... Oh, no, 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 I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that that, that is not likely because I agree with you there. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of what we what we can do, I mean, like, uh, ultimately, why did Alexa work? Or the Echo, sorry. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> <it's not too laughs> uh, because it, it, you know, even more so than on the phone, and even more so than having smart devices where we would have remotes in just the right place, uh, you know, uh, we were able to kind of interact with things from further away. This would be the next logical step beyond that. Literally anything that we want to control uh, with our voice is a crude version of what we could control uh, directly from our brain. Yeah. So a uh, brain expert, Tally Zarell in the chat brings mm -hmm. up that the hard part with looking at dreams would be decoding the input and also finding out where the visual components are uh, in the, in the brain. Sure. I could have sworn like five or six years ago, and there might be somebody in the chat or, or Bryce might have magic fingers to, to make this happen. I could have sworn that there was some story about a brain hookup thing where somebody was, fed the Pink Panther movie with um, uh, uh, Stephen uh, 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 Steve Martin and 
there was some kind of like just from the brain imaging information in the optic nerve, they were able to piece together, give or take what it looked like. And it, and it was like a machine learning thing before we even uh, commonplace use the words machine learning. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not I don't, I don't remember that. Uh, yeah, and there there was some kind of visual like what they did is they had a library of a whole bunch of um images and it uh it 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 it, it overlaid them all. Uh the idea being and and that's a fair point in the chat Tally Zarel pointing out that that's not a dream that's visual input. Um keep in mind this is my half remembered thing that almost it's certainly Brian is wrong. Dream. Brian <laughs> dreamed this last night and now he's telling us. But it, uh, I believe the the implication was that it could whatever the technology was, and again, you know, this is we live in the age where non scientific bloggers have to somehow <laughs> condense these gigantic ideas into a single headline that'll go viral. So mm -hmm. it almost certainly was wrong. But uh, man, I, I, I oh, what a bummer that I can't remember that. So a few years back, Elon Musk actually gave a little bit of a hint at what. Neuralink could be used for. Uh, he says, quote, I don't love the idea of being an AI's house cat, but what's the solution? I think one of the solutions that seem maybe the best is to add an AI layer. So in a world where automation um, is is coming faster sooner rather than later, um, having uh, humans controlling the AI or controlling the, the automated machinery uh, via, via Neuralink seems like a an enterprise solution for this. Uh, I mean, we're talking about like, we're talking some avatar stuff at this point, right? Where it's just like you become the the machine and, yeah, and it, you, it, what you perceive mm -hmm. as your hands and feet are in fact the or robot even, arms. You know, even a dashboard, right? Even if you're like, you got a whole control panel set up to monitor, you know, say you're monitoring a power plant. You could, I, I imagine, digitize all of that through a neural link, right? Get all of the inputs and all of the readings and then send signals and, I guess, communicate with other, I don't know, other, other controllers. I, I, I think there's interesting tech elements there, but I don't think that's the sec a big, sexy consumer use that you would put on a live oh, stream. Oh, here's a nutty idea. Think about this. And maybe this is fueled because I just finished watching Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. But imagine... There, there, there's been. Do you remember we talked about the vest that would constantly be supplying haptic input on, uh, on your back, and uh, you would sort of at a low grade have an awareness of what things are like in the stock market, or like, like the idea being that the longer sure. you yeah. have this input, you would start to think, oh, I feel like corn futures are about to plummet. And this was an idea or uh, uh, no, no, a the, real story? Uh, this is a real story that is uh, actually in experimentation right now sure. because there's there's a bunch of things that, that we are aware of that we're not even aware that we're aware of. So the idea is if we feed that input in, that, that we start to have pattern recognition and then we uh, recognize things shortly before they, they happen. So the idea was mm. there's a vest that would be plugged into the stock market, basically. And and through all these little uh, – likewise, same with um, uh, like a little electrical grid on your tongue that would feed in input. Um, what if – what if your your job – what if a neural uh, neural link was a more efficient way to do that same thing, only directly with your brain? Mm -hmm. And so – you could plug in to, let's say, a nuclear reactor and have just a general awareness of what's happening at all times, and you would internalize it. So all of a sudden, like, somebody's full-time job is just to sit and take eight-hour shifts, essentially being a nuclear reactor and sure. feeling what what is what is out of whack. Like, it's like, eh, I'm, I'm feeling like the, 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 you know, the fourth bank of control rods is a little bit hot or whatever sure sure i th it sounds a little like precogs though it kind of sounds like human machinery human I mean, machine hybrid I that, but that's that's the point that's that's elon musk's point is you know part of his hedge here is that he's terrified of ai effectively eradicating humanity mm -hmm. right uh and that we uh, totally cede our place in in the universe because we have created children far exponentially more powerful than he, we, we ever will be. So the idea is we kind of want to interbreed immediately. So anything that we would think of as, oh, AI would help us here, 
We want to be in on shaping how that is as opposed to AI, at least in the the most grim view, uh, growing up, understanding that they control that they that uh, their foot was on our necks the entire time. And all they had to do was step on it to rid themselves of these, uh, you know, silly ants. By the way, tip of the hat to BioCow in the chat who found the article I was half remembering, uh, Daily Mail, shows a reconstruction of, uh, it, it doesn't sound like it's visual imagery, but it says, and again, this is a headline, so who knows if you can trust it. So our minds can be read, colon, a magnetic scanner produces these actual images from inside people's brains. So uh, these are visual images from analysis of the blood flow to the brain, and it's fairly uh, shocking and remarkable how how clearly they're they're duplicating the images that uh, uh, that are are used. I don't know if they're just visualizing them or well, probably and, just looking at them. So uh, uh, remind me that uh, these images, these source images, were being fed to participants. Uh, man, this is an old story. Let's see. This is 2011, which is why I didn't remember it. Uh, okay. Daily Mail says scientists have created a revolutionary brain imaging process, which allows them to quote, see moving images inside people's minds. Test subjects think of a video. Researchers see it on the screen. It's the most astonishing demonstration of mind reading technology ever demonstrated. Um, these examples that they show side by side are so on the nose that it makes me, it, it triggers a little bit of my 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 baloney detection but um you know uc berkeley managed to decipher brain activity by measuring blood flow to the brain's visual cortex and they use this information to construct images of what they were thinking and then there's some uh details there we go the breakthrough paves the way for reproducing the movies inside our heads that nobody sees such as dreams and memories according to researchers so Think about people who are are locked in, but uh, but uh, fully aware in their brain. They have the opportunity to visualize and and show things of of what's inside their mind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it is hoped that the remarkable process could eventually be used to understand the minds of those who cannot communicate verbally, such as stroke victims and coma patients. So, uh, I I don't know where this lands on the science pseudoscience scale especially given the fact that it was eight years ago and I haven't heard about it again. I'm just trying to figure out which direction this is going, whether they're this, being fed these source images or whether they're trying to decode the If, if you look at the bottom images. of it, there's a YouTube video on there where basically sure. they present someone a clip and then they have them think of it and then they look at the brain activity and from the brain activity, without necessarily knowing what the clip is, they attempt to reconstruct it based on the brain activity. So they're intentionally thinking of. So this is not dreams. The, these are people's no, no, no. Thoughts. Yeah, yeah. That's that's you know. Co uh, co they're correct. Sure, they're showing the video and then trying to manage and trying to decipher what is going on in their head while they watch the video. Correct. But okay. but unlike we, we were, were talking, talking about, about before, this is not just the visual. Yeah component this is this is within the brain this is only looking at brain activity sure, so sure. theoretically whether you are um looking at the thing or dreaming the thing if you're only measuring the brain activity it should be uh, uh I, I guess close i i don't know okay there you go here's uh, something i do know that you can head on over to patreon.com slash weird things patreon.com slash weird things is where you can support this very show no matter what even if one of our uh, uh, dearly departed co-hosts is currently flying back and can't do the show, we're going to make sure we do one for you right here every Monday. Get your week started off right. Patreon.com slash weird things also gets you the after things program where we talk about how we're running our businesses. We use uh, answer questions, use real numbers, real examples, and every once in a while talk about uh, a spoilerific uh, parts of uh, art and pop culture that we like. Yeah. So head on over there right now, patreon.com slash weird things. Did, did I cut off the last half of that story there, Bryce? No, that was uh, that was pretty much it. Okay, good. Uh, I got a video for you guys. Oh, good. And um, and, I, and also I have this helmet that I would like both of you to wear, <laughs> and I want you to remember this clip. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be pretty honest with you. This one's not going to be uh, – you're going to see it, and you're going to know what's going on. 
Uh, oh, you know what's funny is I immediately thought spiders when I looked at it, but but those appear to be crabs dangling. Oh yeah. Oh wait a minute, I, this is Florida. This is I, Florida. These I, these have to be crabs that that crawled out of a swamp and are climbing up like Kingdom of the Spiders uh, with William Shatner climbing all over a how. Uh, 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 for those who don't know, in Florida, a, sure. nobody has an exposed backyard. Everyone has these uh, yeah. screen door space pods. Because God forbid any of Florida should get. Well, look near at the it. Pool. This is very clearly like the the crabs are on the screen. There, there are uh, per the report from uh, from the story, hundreds of crabs in this man's yard. Yeah. Uh, apparently, the rains came in and uh, washed the crabs out of their burrows, and they all scurried onto his land. This reminds me of a movie. I saw this. Oh, go ahead, Justin. Oh yeah, no, 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 yeah. The crabs are just panic. They're, they're grabbing onto whatever they, uh, the, whatever they see. What, what, what movie did you catch this weekend, Brian? So Josie, <clears throat> Josie says, "Dad, there's a movie I want to go see, but you're pretty good at knowing, you know, which movies are worth seeing and which are not." Which is code for I just haven't explained how to search stuff on Rotten Tomatoes to my chi my kid yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's like, uh, "It's it's called Crawl," and and I'm like, "What is it?" You're like, "It's about." alligators getting people and oh like, the one in the basement yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, and so i go to rotten tomatoes and uh, uh crawl and i'm i'm waiting for you know 50 percent so i could tell her no we won't go see it instead 88 percent positive reviews <laughs> produced by sam raby and i was like well, i guess we're gonna go see crawl <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is like a it was a is it in florida where this takes place it is a it's a coastal town that gets flooded and yeah the idea is that it's in a uh, it's in florida during a category five hurricane and they're all like nobody could come help you mandatory Please evacuations leave. you need to leave right now um um, and then the, the woman stays behind to save her father or something. She and... she finds her dad, and her dad is injured because of an alligator. Um, hey, Justin. Yeah. Florida, Florida resident, Florida sure. native. Yeah. Uh huh. Do 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 alligators love to eat people? Is that is that a thing? I mean, uh, <laughs> you, got, you got to really horse around with an alligator <laughs> to, to to get it uh, angry enough to just start eating people like. I mean, I'm sure I'm no. I mean, I'm I'm only an expert on alligators enough that I live, I grew up in Florida, but uh, I'm sure that there's some scenario where if you have a bunch of them that are very agitated, that they are just going to start trying to eat everything or de defend, destroy everything around them. But no, there's no like, oh, I got to the, the alligator got a taste for blood and now it needs to go get it. Cause that, <laughs> that's the one thing, like one thing I know for sure alligators love is marshmallows. And there's definitely a scene where all of these alligators are ignoring, in the movie? Uh, oh, no, 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 in real life, oh, okay. uh, in real life, they love marshmallows. No, I know what you're saying. A scene, there's a scene in the movie okay, yes, in where the movie. all the alligators are ignoring the the flooded convenience station with all of the marshmallows they could ever want and instead hunting down every human <laughs> that's around and outside the convenience store uh but if you get past that it's it's a fine oh the mcguffin's just out of reach i gotta get past the alligator to do it yeah huh. yeah i mean it, it seemed like a i don't know the trailer seemed like it, it was a fairly uh, effective like oh no how are we gonna get out of this sunken room mm-hmm how are we going to get into the crawl space? <laughs> it, it literally takes place in a crawl space. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, so did you like it? There, uh, there... I. <laughs> That's a no. I didn't ask for a refund. Uh, uh, I knew. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, yeah, I, I knew it was a scorpion when I picked it up. <laughs> I knew it was an alligator when I tried to swim past it. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Hold on. So, Josie asked for this movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, is she like. Because that seems a little intense. For, she, uh, for she's uh, an 11 year old. Oh, well, she's uh, what, uh, three or four months away from being 12, but like she's really testing her boundaries. In fact, on the flight out to uh, uh, to VidCon, we watched Game Night and uh, and it was it, it, she loved it. It was great, yeah. you know, a little bit of blood. Uh, and then, uh, oh, a uh, huge shout out to commonsensemedia.org, the reason that we went and saw this because it's rated R. And then the question, of course, is like, well, why is it rated R? And their sure. breakdown of like, they okay, do content uh, 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 
warnings basically yeah basically they're all like they're like there there are a bunch of s words a few f words one gd and one blah 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 sure. and then it's like uh, uh there's it's kind of be... like did does the dog die.com yeah it's it's where it's very similar it's like is there an animal in the film does the animal die do people get sick is there vomit is there blood and stuff like that yeah, yeah. and and also they have i like the fact that they have two different rating systems they have parents say this is appropriate for say 13 and up and then it says kids say. So these are other kids saying what age kids should be to watch it. And kids mm -hmm. sh say it should be, you know, whatever age and up. Hmm. It yeah, was a, uh, uh, it was a uh, bio cow's asking if Josie liked it. Uh, the parts she watched. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, she had to pee when the arm got bit off. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> but but it is one of those movies where, uh, like, uh, I, hopefully this isn't too graphic. But like, dude has bone outside of his body uh, oh, scene where he has to put it back oh. straps it together never mentioned again he's running wait he's he running a, on yeah. this definitely severed broken bone he had a compound <laughs> fracture and he snaps it back into place yeah. and it, but 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 he but he takes his belt and puts a oh, wrench well, on oh, it okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that problem is you guys don't know is that's an old florida trick that's a florida thing yeah uh, hey uh pull up your calendars are you guys doing anything on september 20th Oh, I can't think of anything. I, I, I could check. Hold on. Maybe, oh, maybe go check on September 20th.com. Uh, well, I don't know. This is a test. Is there like something that's really important that we've committed ourselves to? <laughs> not yet. Uh, September 20th. If Andrew, if Andrew was asking this question, I'd be like, of course not, Andrew. Like, let's all go down this fun story route. But you're like, anything on September 20th? And I'm like, oh, crap. Is that the night attack? <laughs> no, September, Friday, September 20th. You can join. Uh, 1.1 million people who are Facebook committed to going and storming Area 51. Yes! They can't stop all of us. This has run roughshod over social media. I love this story so much. That have you heard about this at all? Brian? Yes, I only only the echoes of it. So I know nothing of the uh, of here are the details. Who, who created this idea? We will this this. this this terrible, terrible idea. We will all meet up at Area 51 Area uh, Alien Center Tourist Attraction and coordinate our entry. If we Naruto run, we can move faster than their bullets. What? Let's see them aliens. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea being that they will storm Area 51 because they can't kill all of us. Can't and... stop all of us. <laughs> right. they, what, you're, what you're missing here is the fact that they can't stop all of they us. They can't stop all of them is the thing about yeah. it. Look, man, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I saw the box office returns on, on Serenity. They can stop the signal, and they have, and they do. No, no. See, but what you're missing here is the Naruto running because you That's can right. do that faster than bullets. So D what what you have to focus on is that there's enough. And, Bryce, what is what is that uh, what is what is that at now? 1.1 uh, million people can, uh, in on going and then almost another million interested in going. <sighs> yeah. So that's damn near 2 million people, and we're not even close to D-Day here, that are all going to go down to Area 51, uh, Naruto run through uh, any, kind of, uh, uh, any kind of security, and they're going to see them aliens. I mean, it's mm. about time. A lot of people say that Gen Z is a frivolous, uh, you know, a frivolous generation, but I think that they're actually making the kind of change that we should have had in this country for years. That's right. Man, I'm going to post in the chat, uh, what's old is new again, because I already saw this play out. On AM radio, as I listened to somebody claiming to be in a Cessna flying into <laughs> to Area 51. Now, you might say that somebody might have, you know, done a little radio acting uh, on there. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it seems to me that it's an effective simulation of what it would be like to try to <laughs> enter Area 51. So uh, most most people posting from in the Facebook group are... Are even explicitly saying, hey, this is a joke, right? Uh, quote, uh, Jackson Barnes says, quote, P.S. Hello, U.S. government. This is a joke. I do not actually intend to go ahead with this plan. I just thought it would be funny to get some thumbsy upsies on the internet. I'm not responsible if people decide to actually store Area 51, which prompted the I, I love the way where people announce what they are and are not responsible for. It's like, eh, I, I don't know that you get to be the arbiter of what you're responsible for. Apparently, this Jackson well, I, Barnes I think, I think wrote a game plan. stating what you believe you're responsible for is probably Probably a fairly prudent uh, legal strategy, just in case something happens. Like if you're, yeah, you know, within 48 hours, because this thing blew up. This became like the internet joke, uh, uh, like over the course of like 12 hours, mm -hmm. uh, where all the Reddit memes were all about Area 51, and uh, uh, it was it was just a wildfire. 
But yeah, I don't know. It's funny. It's just a funny joke that Naruto running the, you know, uh, all the things that are going to happen as soon as you, you get into Area 51, what the aliens are going to be like. It was a good, it was a funny joke. Apparently, uh, the Washington Post went and talked to Air Force spokeswoman Laura McAndrews uh, to ask if they were aware of the vent, and they were. <laughs> oh, who knew that the military base was plugged in to win two million people indicated interest in storming their military base? Well, McAndrews said she wouldn't elaborate on specific plans. She did have this quote, quote, Area 51 is an open training range for the U.S. Air Force, and we d would discourage anyone from trying to come into the area where we train American armed forces. The U.S. Air Force always stands ready to protect America and its assets. From Americans. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that that's like a boilerplate that just gets auto completed to like every statement from the Air Force. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I kind of feel. <laughs> there have been a lot of a lot of good memes coming out There's of this. There's really good ones, like <laughs> it's the Area 51, and then like now the new thing is all the people that are going to like that are joining it. So it'll be like. Famous people, yeah, like uh, uh, Chuck, Chuck Norris, Curtis, the last one there, mm -hmm. uh, which is none of it's real, obviously. This is just like the meme. But now, now with that many people, though, do you think that what percentage do you think would actually show up? Because uh, that's a statistically significant sample size of a million people. And I'm going to say that even if you it, think of like the Facebook rule of like only 30 percent of people who say they're going to go to your event are going to go to your event. Right. That's still 300,000 people. Right. And so so let's go way farther. And let's say there's point oh three percent that are mentally imbalanced enough that that they <laughs> feel like like, well, let's do it. Like what number does Vegas have betting odds on this? Should we hit up Mitzula? <laughs> <laughs> sure, we could get it handicapped for sure with Mitzi. But I would say, look, Brian. If there were somebody who were enterprising enough to say in the nearest town next to Area 51, we are going to hold Alien Con and we're going to find, you know, some decent sized music act that will like headline, you know, Alien Con or whatever. I'm sure you could probably get, you know, tens of thousands, oh. maybe. Yeah, what if this thousands? is a fire sure. fest thing? What if this is viral marketing for a festival? So that you, would be the perfect thing. Well, because there's already tourism around there. Yep. Ooh. Well, and so and imagine this: mm -hmm. uh, you start booking right now, folks who have um, like a like Vive uh, games, where it's just like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, come experience our new game, Storm Area Fifty One. Strap on <laughs> these goggles. Uh, yeah, that's the game, Storm line. Area Fifty One. Colon, they can't stop all of us. Yeah, exactly, right. And then and then that's like, I mean, not that they would like. What, what I'm saying is like somebody mm -hmm. could skin a game in the next uh, two months. To, to match the narrative, not that the narrative was created to promote oh, a no, game. It would have to be like a tower defense game where you're just mowing down weebs. Oh, <laughs> ah, no! oh why is somebody not doing it? You're <laughs> Area 51. You've yeah. got the Tesseract. You've you need to stop, stop all, all of these crazy people. And every so often, you mm -hmm. get like Joe Rogan as a mini boss walking in. You got you to, he's He goes down easy. I bet he goes down easy. Him, yeah. <laughs> Oh man! So book 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 your flights now, September twentieth. They can't stop all of us. I oh man, I would. I hope people are safe because I know that Area Fifty One doesn't play around with people trying to come on that base. Uh, uh, I mean, look, it, you you are right now to worry about it because it has broken containment beyond just like okay, this is some little pocket of the internet now it is kind of broken wider so you don't know if there's somebody that's going to be like yeah let's really do it we're really going to run in at first but i would bet that no one's that this is not yeah. a i mean problem. i i remember flying on like national opt-out day uh where everybody swore they were going to opt out with the tsa mm -hmm. and i was like well oh, yeah. or as i call it tuesday you know like like <laughs> like that was nothing but i was prepared for it's like well if everybody be a plays lot of the people. same game as me, sure. nobody did. Everybody was yeah. just like, eh, just scam me. Because there are millions of travelers across hundreds of airports just in the U.S., right? Yeah. Well, so it's like, all right, so wait, uh, Area 51 is in what, Nevada? Nevada, about two hours away from Las Vegas, I believe. So it's like, all right, aside from people in that area that would, you know, like be interested in seeing the poop show, uh, you know, who else, who's calling in for a, for a you know, 
a vacation day so they can go <laughs> Yeah, start. make a day go, trip to, to Area 51. Uh, you know, what's funny. is I'm like, I could think of nothing dumber than taking vacation time to go to the desert of Nevada. What's <laughs> there? Oh, wait, Burning Man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. Or Vegas. <laughs> like, I yeah. guess there's a lot of cool stuff in the desert of Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Or the desert of Nevada. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, uh, we gotta. We're gonna. We're gonna take it up to the skies now. Uh, yeah, taking it to the skies. Do take it to the skies. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know about uh, planets. Yep. You know about heard moons. of them. Yeah. Uh, do you know the name of what happens when an object orbits a moon? It's not just a. It's not a, a, a lunar satellite. Uh, it's not uh, quite a, 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 a morbid. Not quite. Actually, uh, the label given about la late last year for an object that orbits a moon is a moon moon. Wait, a moon moon? A moon moon. Wait, this is a oh. new distinction that they gave it? Uh, last year, yeah, astronomers decided moons which orbit other moons should get their own name, and it's moon moon. So, so is it a moon 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 if a speck of dust is floating around a thing that floats around a moon? I mean, why not? But now there's another new name. So there's a there's a term or there, there's a I guess a phenomena that we didn't have a name for before, where a moon would break out of orbit from its planet and then enter its own orbit, say around a sun. I thought that was like a rogue planet or a rogue moon or something. Uh, the, it might be different. I think this is one that goes into an orbit rather than one that flies a little stray yeah uh there's a new name for these massive moons that break free from their orbit they're called plunets 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 what? oh because planet planet moons. and moon Plun yeah p-l-o-o-n-e-t-s that's right p-l-o-o-n-e-t-s <sighs> all right <laughs> <laughs> all right listen who's who's on dignity check <laughs> <laughs> like who's there's got to be I, I understand like look at some point somebody has to be there to make sure that it that, that this multi-million dollar structure is not named Bodie McBoatface right <laughs> like there's got to be there's got to be somebody who's just like look I get it and you can present your reasoning but if you want to call a breakaway planet like like a Mooney McMoon Moon <laughs> the, uh, fish but you're like no no mm -hmm. get out of here do, do you remember when they officially changed the name of the international space station to space station alpha like no uh, i think it was like six or eight years ago and just everybody refused to use it <laughs> nobody used it and then they, it's back to the international space station or for all i know maybe it's still changed to alpha at this point oh interesting but that was just just to change it well no i i don't know what the justification was but but there it was an official like hey We've changed the name. Mm -hmm. It's now Alpha. So if you don't mind, please use the name Alpha. Refer to Space Station yeah. Alpha. And then Com nobody did it. Yeah, commence everybody on Earth doing the slow roll the dice motion. <laughs> like, sure. <laughs> Whatever Space Station. <laughs> space Station. Eat it. Mm. Uh, apparently, our own moon could one day apparently become a planet because the moon is very slowly creeping away from Earth's orbit. Yeah, it's uh, it's very embarrassed by what it sees it on like planet it. Earth, and it's just like, Ugh, I'm just gonna, the punch is over here. Yeah, I got a I'm thing to gonna... do in a couple million yeah, years. Yeah, the moon slowly fine. turning into it's the fine. no Drake face. <laughs> 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 All right, we got one last little story here. You might know about this, um, but I, I have a little bit of history. There's a little bit of a history story here. Do you know an island off the coast of North Carolina called Ocracoke? Oh, sorry, spell that. Uh, o C R A C O K E. Okra Coke. Okra Coke. Okra Coke. Oh yeah, no, you got a bunch of of hippies who love drugs. They're they're <laughs> okay. eating their okra and doing their coke. Okra yeah, Coke. Exactly. They love it, and they put it in there too. They mix them up, you know, have a coke filled oak. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they uh, uh, and they actually dry out the okra and then snort it. Uh, oh wow. They they they, 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 they no, yes. no crushing in any part of that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. They just have dangling Just a big tendrils. piece of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, Ocracoke uh, is an island about 16 miles off the coastline of North Carolina. You probably know it for being a island that has its own distinct Elizabethan dialect. Whoa! No, I don't know that. I was going to say it had something to do with like um, uh, the first Civil War submarines or something, but this is much more interesting. No, it's a, a little bit before. Uh, so the people who have um, uh, this dialect, uh, they're called Hoy Toiters, uh, kind of like, like high titers. High titers, uh, hoy toiters. I see. 
And so, so high titers is the way we would say it, but but hoi toiters indicates the nature of the dialect a little bit, and and it's a mix of things. So, uh, I guess uh, this goes back to William Howard, who was an outlaw who worked on one of Blackbeard's ships, and left uh, before Blackbeard's final battle, made it to Virginia. I guess King George the First at the time was offering a pardon, a blanket pardon to any pirate who I guess was defecting. But then he settled on uh, this island. Uh, he, he bought Ocracoke Island for about 105 pounds and uh, ended up settling there with a bunch of ex-pirates, uh, boat pirates. There were Native American tribes who had settled there. Um, the Wokon tribe uh, initially was called Wokacoke, uh, but because it, through misspellings and mispronunciations, it became Wokacon, Ocracoke, Ocracoke. And now Ocracoke. How close do we think this dialect is to the way it was hundreds of years ago? Well, part of it is that it's a it's it it is a little bit of Elizabethan English, but also it's a mix because you have the Native Americans, you have other um, other so it's, pirates it's a bit from like other Creole, nationalities, where where you have uh, elements of French and, uh, right. and bastardized English, right? And not not only that, you know, for for the past three hundred or so years. They've been creating their own language. They've been creating new words, and and you know it's it's kind of a Galapagos effect. It's it's all circulating there because it's 16 miles away from from coast. Now I had I had heard at some point that what we perceive as American English was pretty close to the way people spoke uh, 200 years ago, around the time that we uh, split off from from Britain. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it became in fashion for people to speak overly fancy. What we perceive as as, as the British accent uh, was, was an affectation that began at the aristocracy and worked its way down. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, the way you know, American Americans English speak. is 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 the original Queen's English or King's English. Yeah, um, actually, I think we've got a clip here of. Yeah, that's what I want. I need to hear these people going crazy with their silly accent. Yeah, so I think we've got a little Okra Coke, the Okra Coke brogue. <laughs> so, so we get a couple styrofoam coolers and and put them in there and put ice and newspaper on top of them, wrap them up with duct tape, and uh, we come up when we get to the airport. We. Well, here's some more luggage, you know. We got these sort of tubes. Pause, 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 pause. Like, it's a like, mix like, of southern and English. It really sounds English. southern, yeah. Yeah. And, and I believe, and now that I think about it, I, I I think that the story was like southern English was sort of, uh, you know, nowadays we yeah. speak with West Coast English because of the influence of, of Hollywood. Hollywood media. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, keep going. This is amazing. Here you go to Las Vegas and take a chance to, to, to spend anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars. Instead of buying a, a 15 to 10, 15 dollar cooler, we got these old star phone ones like that. Uh -huh. Fill them up with oysters and wrap, and wrap tape around them. Davey done that. Davey Rick. So, uh, it almost sounds like, like the Baltimore accent to me. Like with like a lot of those like round like oh, oh, like oh, hun, oh. Yeah, yeah, it, it it definitely is is a mix. Now the thing about the ochre coke, I, I'm I'm saying I'm calling BS on Elizabethan though. <laughs> I I hear no Elizabethan English in that. Well, but again, to to remind you, what we perceive as Elizabethan e English uh, was very, very likely to Southern American English. Sure. Okay. Well, then, if you're going to subvert the entire concept of what somebody would think of when they think of the phrase Elizabethan English, then yes, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm subscribing to your newsletter that I had no idea what Elizabethan English sounded like, and instead, this is what it was. So, uh, one of the problems with the hoi toiter brogue is that uh, Ocracoke only only has a population today of less than a thousand residents. Um, and they have power, they have internet, and so uh, the the young people that are are growing up there, fewer and fewer of them are retaining this this dialect because they you know watch YouTube and they watch television and um, they see how you know uh, you know people on the mainland speak, and so they um, they they uh, are are not picking it up or not I guess committing to it's not the right word but it, it's not they're not taking up the affect do do you perceive either of you guys that that anything is lost by by them speaking the same way that everybody else speaks in in the country i understand this sort of like nostalgic like oh the thing was there and now it's gone but it's like it's easy to have that 
affinity when you're not the one who's limiting their life options by not speaking think, the same yeah. way as everybody else? I think that's that's the biggest thing is that the subjugation of accents seems to be almost directly correlated with how far people want to leave from the area where that accent is the only thing that happens, right? Sure. And you hear, you see this a lot with Southern accents. My mom uh, uh, deliberately tried to uh, not speak with a New York accent when she moved down to Florida because she didn't want to be known as the New York girl uh, uh, when she was mixing up with the uh, people that were not going to speak the same way. Uh, but yeah, so I think it's, it's one of those things where on one hand, if it's like, oh, if you love okra coke and you're going to live in okra coke and you're going to die in okra coke, then that's fine. Right. Then, then you're going to keep that. But if you want to go to college on the mainland and next thing you know, you're in UNC Chapel Hill and then you get a job in Boston, then that accent's probably going to go away. You yeah. know, I, I, uh, sorry. Uh, well, so a part of it is that this, this Island is, is really remote, right? It's 16 miles away. So you, there's no bridge uh there wasn't a ferry service until 1957 so it was a very isolated uh, uh a community right if you needed something if you were going to the mainland you were going on a haul there was no trip that was not a haul to bring supplies in mm -hmm. and and so I, I think that that's part of it is is uh for for you know 250 years it was a rather locked in community and it was a small, you know, ruralish community. So you could, you could live and, 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 and thrive there. But, but you're right. Like with, with internet, you know, they, they got electricity in 1938. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, having the option to leave is, is something that, that, you know, new well, and, generations and even if you don't plan to leave, you might want to start a YouTube channel and you might want to be understood by people who are watching your YouTube channel. I, I, I think about how annoyed I would get at people who would go overseas to, let's say, England for one year and come back with with this thick English accent. And I used mm -hmm. to feel like it was such a fake affectation. But nowadays I'm a little more permissive because um, you have to live I think, there. You have to be understood. Well, and it's not just being understood. It's like, do I want every conversation to begin with me talking and somebody pausing and saying, oh, you're an American. And it's like, if that part is not a fun side quest on the journey to find out which way it is to get to the whatever place, yeah. then I might just decide it's easier to soften my language and, and, and blend in, uh, yeah. chameleon it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and even more so if you need something from somebody like a job or or a promotion or something like that, if you're living or working uh, at some place for a, a significant amount of time, then at, such, at a certain point, you're probably going to want to impress somebody. Mm -hmm. And you might find it easier if you're speaking literally more of their language than you would otherwise. Yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I I, I think effectively nothing will be lost to the rest of the world if you know, in a few generations, which is what they es estimate is, is all the, the, the dialect has left is a couple more generations in it. But, you know, it's, uh, I, it also, I, I don't know, it, it seems a shame to get rid of something that doesn't need to be got. I mean, I would feel bad if language weren't constantly splintering into cultural stuff. We live in a world where people communicate with pictures with their meme culture now. Sure. And that's, that's something that physically couldn't exist in a pre-internet era, unless you walked around with a flip book and, uh, and a bunch of cut and paste uh, uh, tools. Um, so I suspect that what we're going to get is a richer diversity in the future. Um, it just seems so patronizing to say like, oh, well, me, someone on the outside, uh, privileged and a visitor, thinks it's very quaint that you're living this this life. Um, there's a similar thing in Hawaii. There's some island that only people who are born on the island are allowed to live on the island. Mm -hmm. And the youngest generation keeps on saying like, uh, no, we would like Internet. And they keep leaving. And then there's a sort of, oh, woe is us. What a cultural loss. And But meanwhile, it's like these are all individual human beings who deserve every opportunity laid out in front of them. And I don't know that, that it's for any of us to tell them to, uh, to, to you know, to, to stop and stay in their zoo. Oh, no so one's saying we can, that. You know, I, oh, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not saying we have to do anything. I'm just saying it would, it would be, we would lose something very small, but something nonetheless. It was, yeah. uh, we would lose an oddity of the world. But also, I, I don't know for sure if this will ever really totally go away. Things like this, cultural traditions like this have a way of, if even just for, even if it eventually is just, the crazy old 
you know, man and his uh, family that never is allowed outside. Someone's going to be speaking with this accent for a very, very long time if the the balance of the island possibly isn't. Yeah, hopefully. I don't know. Well, uh, we'll see. Apparently, of the less than a thousand people who live on the island, only about half of them have the full uh, dialect, the hoi toiter brogue. But also, it's like, man, our sliding scale on this kind of stuff moves all the time. Like, I, I am at least now old enough to realize that there's so much that falls down the memory hole on exactly what, like, how important this was, what it meant, like, like uh, how thick the accent needs to be to actually be the hoi toiter brogue, or is it just that you say certain words a little bit different? You know, yeah. is it like, you know, does it just become that, you know, Pittsburghers say yins instead of y'all, uh, uh, that, that there's something like that, that that just continues and persists? Yeah. A, a big part of it seems to be having some kind of political boundary, political barrier, uh, like, uh, you know, Norwegian and Swedish, if I understand correctly, are close enough that they could pretty much talk to each other. They're closer to each other, but considered separate languages closer than, let's say, uh, I, I don't know, p pick any two extreme dialects in the United States. Uh, and yet we oh, really? insist on calling all of that English when, in fact, they're farther apart. Um, hmm. Yeah. Oh, OK. Interesting. So like 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 Valley Girl and and Bostonian. Yeah, or or um uh, uh what was what was the word? Oh, in the '90s they were calling it ebonics or whatever. But like ebonics uh, had uh, its own uh, distinct set of rules regarding regarding the the conjugation of certain verbs, and yeah. they were more extreme than the rules that differentiated Swedish from Norwegian. And mm -hmm. yet they had because they had a political barrier, there was remember there was that whole fake like, you know, now they want to teach math and ebonics. And uh meanwhile, I remember my linguistics teacher saying, uh factually there are structures that are farther apart than, you know, what we already consider two different languages. Hmm. Interesting. Very cool. Uh well do you guys want to get into picks? Yeah, I got a pick. What's your I got a, I got a new podcast okay. that I am in love with. I don't I don't think I've mentioned it before. I hope I haven't. Uh, did we talk about the Pessimists Archive? No. Oh my goodness, it is wonderful. I stumbled across it because they interviewed the host on a, a Reason podcast, and it is all about the constant hysteria of things that you would not expect to be that are not controversial today, but it's about the negative hysteria about everything from the waltz to chess, mm -hmm. to novels, novels. Oh, uh, there were That's stories great. about about the, the, the terrors of, of novels to uh, the telegraph. Uh, it's fantastic. And and it does a uh, the guy keeps it light and he is constantly keeping you uh, when, when it's all about the pessimism of the time. He figures out a good way to keep it light by constantly sort of breaking and making goofy metaphors and going on real quick side jags. It's enough to really keep you engaged. The bicycle. Did you know that the bicycle was 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 super controversial at you the time? The, you mean the devil swing? <laughs> Is that what they call it? I love that. <laughs> but but there was something about the fact that that oh, all these wheels rounding around in circles. It'll turn you insane. Literal thing that people mm. were, were were doing. Same I mean, thing uh, an awful lot of it is <laughs> is you know anti women like the waltz was thought to drive women crazy because like well you're just spinning them around and around and then next thing you know they might they might need to sit in somebody's coach and they could be taken advantage of because women don't have agency it's the sure. 1800s yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, weird huh. but but he also draws wonderful parallels to things that are current hysterias that he knows are just going to go away like anything else hmm. it's a fantastic podcast highly highly recommended very cool Justin that is awesome. Uh, crap. What should I pick? Do you want me to do my pick and then you can yeah, you yours? go ahead and do your pick. So, uh, over the weekend I got, or I guess last week I got into the Alamo season pass, their movie pass type ah, product. Is and, it, is it truly all you can eat or, uh, it, yeah, it's a movie a day or okay. is you can make a reservation per day. It, it's a movie a day basically. And, uh, I used it to go see a movie I had heard good things about. I did not see the previous movie from this director, uh, which was also highly re re regarded. Um, but I really, I, I kind of went in not knowing too much about it, but I really enjoyed going to see Midsummer. Uh, oh, I know nothing about it except for that is a very curious 
uh, poster because mm-hmm. it, it it depicts a woman uh, 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 befloraled. I don't know if that's she's a word. Wearing a flower crown. Uh, uh, a, yeah, a flower garland, and, and but she's crying in 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 misery, mm-hmm. and so and it's stre- like the perspective on the the poster is like a little skewed so it kind of looks like you're seeing the side of her face but also the front of it uh it's 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 really great um this is from um ari ari aster who did hereditary Mm -hmm. last year uh it is a folk horror film and it is it is really cool um it's it 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 reminded me of oh what was the um oh there was another horror movie i saw recently that didn't have a lot of like action oh um Ma. I, I went and saw Ma from Blumhouse earlier this year. And I thought that was a really cool concept, but it also didn't have like a lot of horror or gore or, or blood or anything. Um, and I feel the same way about Midsummer, but I also think all of the times it's not being horror and, and you know, suspense, it really gets lost in, you know, this 90, you know, this this festival that only takes place every 90 years and this, this the weird traditions of uh, of of this this. Does it have like a like, like a Wicker Man vibe or something? Is it horror or? or... I, yeah, I, I think it, it definitely is pitching itself, and I, I only know this because for whatever reason, I am the demographic that uh, uh, is is harvesting the the ads for Midsummer. Like I am, mm-hmm. I, I fall exactly in whatever demographic uh, uh, keywords are trying to sell me on going to see this movie. But that was the sense I got, Brian, was that it feels like a very millennial. Wicker yeah. Man, where instead of uh, it being like a, a, a cop or whatever trying to solve a crime in this weird community, it's like, no, of course, like we're going out for this rad experience. Like, imagine all the Instagram photos. And then next thing you know, it's creepy locals doing I- extraordinarily horrific things. Yeah, it's like it's about a group of college age uh, friends going to this town or going to this small village to see this festival. Because I guess they're one of their friends is a foreign exchange student who's from this place, and so uh, uh, Chidi's in it from the good place. I, I don't remember his name. Does does the place turn out to be a, a, a what was it? Coca Cola? What, what was that island? <laughs> the, the one oh, that we Ocracoke? just talked about. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> <Ocracoke. Okay. laughs> But it, it's it is kind of set up in that sort of millennial because most of them are going just to to go, and then uh, the Chidi's character is there to actually do his thesis on the festival, and so it's a mixture of does, like. Does he play actual Chidi working on his actual? Well, this is tied in. Is it is it an extended he, universe of the good place? Oh, <laughs> he's a little more. He's a little more uh, outgoing though. He's he's, he's not as as uh, reserved in the movie. I would love is, I would but... love a good place extended universe. <laughs> oh man, don't make me think about that because I could think about that. But it's it, it's re- it's really good. Um, it's kind of long. It's like two and a half hours, but it's it's really cool. The use of visual effects is mostly really subtle and nice. Uh, the aesthetic of it because it takes place you know in Sweden during the solstice so they only get you know a couple of hours of dark uh, per day and so most of it takes place during the day with this soft you know sunlight and it's it's really cool I I, I really recommend Midsummer. cool all right I got a pick which I only watched the first episode but I liked it I'm curious whether or not either of you guys have seen Stranger Things 3. The show. No, I watched all of that, unfortunately. Uh, Euphoria on HBO. No, no. I've, seen, I've seen trailers for it. This is like the teen drug story, right? If there is a horror series designed for Brian Brushwood. Oh, no! <laughs> it no! is Euphoria. <laughs> Euphoria is basically a teen exploitation series wherein uh, a, a, a really uh, a very captivating cast uh, of young actors uh, led by Zendaya uh, is basically just runs you through every horrifying thing that any kind of mother or father is hoping that they're oh, teen. No, not. isn't this the one? Isn't this the the show with the the orgy scene and there's a double Broke digit? Rec- Broke the record on how many penises were on screen in a television show. And that's like that. That is like the home run record in baseball. It's going to be hard to take down <laughs> because they have it at like 30 dicks 30. like are in this are in this episode. Are, are any of them uh, like given that. this is HBO? Uh, yeah. Are any of them tumescent? I mean, I've it's not an orgy seen the episode scene, yet. I think. I think it's an orgy scene. So 
Yeah, so I would uh, one would guess. Uh, I know one of the main characters eventually becomes a cam girl, uh, and so there are some very specific things played out there. But there was no shortage of wieners in just this random first episode, which includes uh, a hookup between an adult and a teenager on a dating app uh, in a seedy motel, uh, a drug overdose, a drug relapse. Uh, Man, hey, you're just you're just giving me the hard sell on this. I, yeah, I can't wait. Just uh, this is Brian Rushwood. Maybe maybe top, date night. Me and Bonnie will cuddle up and watch <laughs> All this. I'm saying is this. It, it reminded me of a moment wherein I was in Austin, and I, and Brian and I went to go see Spring Breakers. Yes, is a similar you know uh, a Harmony Corinne very much loves to do these wayward youth kind of stories, and uh, I remember walking out. Just the first words that I said to Brian were like, "Well." I know three girls that are never going on spring break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, that's that's immediately what I thought with Euphoria. Because I had heard that, like, it's very well shot and the cast is great, but it is literally just, like, it. it is written as a horror movie to parents mm. with the children, like that, or the young children. Uh, it, it is, like, every element of, like, Basically, it's like a compilation. It's a dramatized compilation of every, like, do you know blank? Well, your kids do, and it could be their death. It, it, it's it's a Rainbow Party the series, basically. Oh, like, God. every yeah. urban legend. Yeah. Every, and, and every element of, uh, you know, a Black Mirror levels of technology gone wrong, but, but less futuristic, more the damage that can be waylaid uh, right now. Uh, uh, yeah. So, I don't know. I, I enjoyed the first episode, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. But certainly, I would I would say that what I will guess is, if, if this is where they're starting the series, I can only imagine that the end of it will do something that will, like, make waves in the television viewer community of, like, oh, my God, I can't believe they did blank, because it's kind of trampled on a few societal norms uh even in the first like four episodes that have come out uh but before that happens but uh, but it sounds I like that's what they're aiming for is to shock people absolutely. to okay i mean mm, i don't like, think that you can watch that show as uh and not assume that they are like looking that the point of the show is that you should be at the very least made uncomfortable and at the very most uh uh tracking your children's every move <laughs> wow. very cool uh all righty well uh that's gonna do it for us this week a uh, weird things for brian rushwood and justin robert young and the late andrew main uh it's been weird there we go look at that an hour the dot wow almost. wow uh mm, man that just flew by yeah. that was great yeah. uh do you guys need a break before we do what do, we, uh, do we have a topic for after things? I got an email, but I need to look it up and. I can talk it out. a little bit about VidCon, but I kind of wanted to save a lot of that for Night Attack because because a lot of that I experience about, is. A... I can talk about Far From Home because I have a lot of Far From Home. <sighs> I haven't seen Far From Home. Oh no! How have you not seen? Because I'm, I'm waiting on big. I'm waiting on big soda. See, how did you go see uh, like Midsummer and not Far? Because I'm not going to use my season pass on Far From Home. Big Summer owes me a ticket. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh. I mean, you can you can catch these spoilers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just... we I, we already did the spoiler in time on it, so I think. Wait, uh, was was Far From Home less than a week ago? It was last week, I believe. Remember, yeah, it opened early to beat. Fourth yeah, of... no. What's funny is I I didn't even I was thinking about Cord Killers and what we'll talk about, and uh, that one didn't even pop into my mind. I was thinking like, oh man, I guess I didn't see much. Mm. I guess we'll talk about Crawl. <laughs> I forgot <laughs> I forgot that we saw Far From Home. <laughs> uh. But yeah, no, I I I loved Far From Home. Yeah, no, no, we did we did already talk about Far From Home on uh, on Cord Killers. That's what I said. You were talking about it last week. Oh, okay, all right. I thought you were saying it came out last week. No, oh was, no, I no, I'm sorry. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got an email here. I I uh, we can we can talk about this. It it would probably be better with Andrew, but I think we can get most of it with us. Let's see, you go to the overlay. Uh, but yeah, if you guys need a break. Yeah, be the time to uh, here I'll, I have no idea if Bonnie is here or not. Classic Bonnie. Quantum wife. <laughs> <laughs> J 
Justin, you've got to go. I think you would love Midsummer. I mean, I look, uh, apparently it. the Instagram uh, advertising algorithm agrees because mm -hmm. uh, that is that is certainly what they have pushed. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I love the concept. I mean, I love Wicker Man. Um, and I think, I mean, really, to be honest, the only thing that that gives me pause is the is the two and a half hours because like yeah I, he's one of those directors with like hereditary being as big as it was that it's like you just know like those run times are never gonna go down no. <laughs> again like, they're always and, uh, at, at, at a certain point you're gonna be like man did this really need to be three hours and 20 minutes yeah there's there are definitely a lot of points that are maybe longer than they need to be yeah um because it kind of i don't know because early on you're like wow this is like you're really taking your time on these like this first day and the second day uh you know like i don't know um i mean it speeds up at at the end but i uh i don't know i was i i think i was glad that it was two and a half hours and not cut down on any plot points yeah, uh, so I, think, I mean, I'm, I think that's where I'm at with it. I'm pumped. I'm pumped to see it. I probably will eventually see it. I don't know if I'll be able to coax Ashley out for it, but um, it'll be seen yeah. eventually at some point. Um, I got I got the Alamo season pass partially to try it out for Cord Killers, but also because Regal still doesn't have their thing out yet for another couple months. Um, and uh, the the thing about the the Alamo going to the Alamo for the, the, the season pass is like, if it, there's pressure, it feels like pressure going to go to the Alamo and not getting like even a soda or, or popcorn. I don't know. I feel weird being like, if you're, if you're, if you're trying to, to keep the, keep, yeah, keep, keep, you, know, you want to go see a bunch of movies, but you also don't want to leave with that like $30 bill every time. time you walk. Yeah. Every time you walk in and out. Right. Cause it's like, uh, cause, cause you, it's all on the phone. So you just go to the theater, but then they check your phone, right? You have to show the phone with it, the yeah. thing pulled up, and they check your ID. Um, uh, but that's also like the the wait staff. So it's like, do you want anything? And I'm like, uh, no. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they don't care, but it just, yeah. Yeah. At, at some point, it's like, how. It's a little thing that builds up. I mean, I saw a lot of movies on Movie Pass, and yeah. the place I went to was not an Alamo, so I didn't really give a crap. You know, by and large, yeah. Look, you walk in. The only interaction you have with a human is the person who checks your ticket or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you're in. You I mean, watch no. the movie, leave. That's it. Like you know, it's not like the, the the guys at the popcorn counter are giving you puppy dog eyes <laughs> or like being like, well, "What the hell are we supposed to do?" Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That'll be an interesting thing to see over the next couple of months. It's been that would be interesting because like if I went, if, if they had it here, I mean, number one, it would be a little annoying because I have to go into San Francisco every time I wanted to see a movie. But right. let's say I really enjoyed it and the Alamo is a great experience. It would be hard. Although I don't know. I feel like if I went in there, I'd be able to talk myself into like, ah, I'll have a drink. Yeah. Because I think the first time I went, I got, I got a beer or something. And I was like, well, you know, this did cost me eight or nine dollars in the tip but i also got into the movie for free so it's like i paid to see a movie and got a free beer i don't know it, it, yeah you, you do weird math with with that sort of thing and then also they charge you the convenience fee so you pay like a dollar seventy to actually go to the movie to, to reserve go. can yeah. you do new movies can you do yeah. like a it, it's you just can't do special screenings or events and alamo does a bunch of those so that's that's kind of the bummer yeah, that kind of sucks. I wonder if like you know they the tickets just went on sale for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, you uh, can you can reserve up to seven days in advance. Oh yeah, see that then I would be screwed. I'd have to actually pay real money to do the two week in advance. Oh right, right. Once right, Upon right. a Time in Hollywood. But you can find next week. You could find a, a seat also. No, but there's some movies I I gotta go see on Thursday. Like when I don't see it on Thursday, then sure. literally, uh uh. uh Take all the times I'm going to talk to Brian and then, uh, you know, uh, add five minutes of the movie that won't be new for me by the time I see it if I don't see it on Thursday. Uh. So I have to go see the Marvel movies on Thursday. I have to go see stuff that I know is going to be like cultural currency, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before before I talk to people because I just spent too much time online yeah. like to, to not 
have it be have it be a thing. And also, it's like I don't know for whatever. I'm just a parody of my demographic that I just need to go see Tarantino movies immediately. Uh, did you need to go to take a break, Justin? No, I'm good. You good? You good, Brian? Yeah. Uh, so we got a question here. No, it, it might be good to hear if you have any businessy, if you got any businessy stuff out of VidCon. I know you have a lot of funny stories, um, but I don't know how much of the businessy stuff is uh, up for talks. I just got a, a tweet <laughs> from somebody who did maybe the kindest thing anybody has ever done for me. Okay. Uh, somebody just tweeted me almost a week after the event saying, Hi! I'm the guy who waved at you at the restaurant. I always heard you were in the area and wondered if I'd see you. So that's what that was. And I was just like, oh, thank God. Because I remembered the exact moment. And I was like, I'm supposed to know who this person is. And I don't. And I'm just <laughs> awkwardly, hey. Oh. And, and so, like, I had been carrying, like. Uh, oh, yeah, really? Yeah. You were holding on to it? Well, I mean, it, it was just, I mean, look, I, I experienced disappointment quite a bit. So so I wasn't really holding on to it. It was just one of many times that I assumed oh I had God. failed to recognize someone. But to be let off the hook and be told, mm -hmm. you weren't supposed to recognize me. I'm a fan. who <laughs> just <laughs> know you're in the area. I was just like, all right, that is that is the nicest thing anyone has done. <laughs> um, I'm going to add him to my homepage there. All right. Oh, ooh. Got it. There we go. Uh, but yeah, so I don't know if there's if you feel like there's any businessy oriented stuff from VidCon you feel uh, we, worth we, talking about. We can about? talk a bit about uh, some of the takeaways on that. Uh, there there okay. was I, I didn't do man oh man if if I wasn't there as a treat for my 11 year old. There's a lot of panels and and tracks I I would have done different. Uh, but there mm -hmm. was a couple that I saw that really opened my eyes to some different uh, business opportunities. Okay, cool. We can do that too. Uh... Uh, anything else, Justin? Anything you want to put on the plate? Otherwise, we got these two things, and that'll probably be. No, no, no. Yeah, I think that's that's that's, that's good. Cool. That's All right. Good time. All right, then uh, let's do after thing. Oh wait, I gotta hit the button. Boop. There we go. We got the button. All right, let's do after things. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to After Things. I'm Bryce Castillo, uh, your host as always here on the show. Uh, joined with Brian Brushwood. Yes, uh, who has also always, always been here. Always here. And mm. Justin Robert Young. Ah, oh, yes. This is my first day, and I look <laughs> forward to making a deep and rich friendship with all of you. <laughs> this is the uh, the podcast all about being a creative professional and some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, uh, the, the different things that we work on. Uh, we got a, an email from a listener. I wanted to get into this first. Um, I know where we. This is a little bit of writing oriented, but I think all three of us ha could maybe sniff this out. I think this is more of a sniffing thing than a writing. Thing. Ah, the sniff test. So we got an email from Ken. Ken writes. So I've got a script in my drawer, and I'm wondering if I should send it into a screenwriting contest. There's a thirty-nine dollar entry fee, or an optional one hundred and eight dollars to get feedback. I suspect that when they're reviewing contest stories that they're looking for ways to eliminate scripts as quickly and efficiently as possible. So theoretically, you could get rejected for formatting your cover page incorrectly. Do you think it's worth the extra $69 to learn why you were rejected? Do you think these contests are worth bothering with at all? When you were starting out, did you or would you enter a magic writing or comedy or podcast whatever competition and would you pay extra for feedback? And how do you tell if a competition is legit and worth your hard-earned loons? That's from Ken. Justin... Uh, yeah. Let, let me let me let me give you my gut check, and you can tell me if it resonates with you. Sure. Um, my gut says that when I was starting in Magic, this kind of thing would be rejected out of hand. But truthfully, it would be rejected because I didn't have the resources. Twenty years later, money looks different to me now, and it basically depends on. What does money mean to you? Because truthfully, I would say that the most valuable thing is a commitment to uh, iterating and writing many, many scripts and having them be rejected here, there and everywhere and eventually becoming a award winning uh, screenwriter or whatever. But if you have money, then what is the point of taking the long way around if you could get at least some feedback? And it seems like, you know, somebody spending their time. It's not the worst thing on the planet if they were to be compensated for their time as they looked at your art. Yeah. Uh, the, the first thing that, that kind of struck me with that email is that uh, there is a lot of looking for the no, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of looking for the permission to say, no, I don't want to do this, which 
like if you're looking for that, then it kind of makes me it makes me think that you are kind of into doing this, but you just don't want to deal with whatever will you know might come of it, uh, or you are recognizing the, the the pitfalls. I don't think an adult, you know, if this is a if this is something that really brings you creative happiness, whether or not you want to make it your full time gig, but even more so if you do, then you know, what's the extra, what is it? 60 bucks or whatever. Like, yeah. you know, that, that seems for somebody with a full-time job, like, yeah, uh, the, the, the difference between entering it and the difference between getting feedback, like is fine. Uh, the biggest thing that I would say is like, I would do it just because if you do want to make this more of your life, like the initial ideas of like, Oh, I want to dip. If, if I dip my toe in the water, will it be cold? Do not they, they pale in comparison to the horrors that lay before you of more complex, multi-layered rejection. These are the things that are in place so the people who care the most get in and the people that are willing to quit stay out. This and is I, uh, I was going to say that, that that's a really good parallel because uh, in Hollywood, they'll still reject you just as hard, but they won't you do the ser they won't do the service of telling you the truth as to why. Like no. if, if you could pay money to get the truth as to why you were rejected out of hand, seems like that might be worth the money. And when it comes to uh, the, he says this is a screenwriting contest, screenwriting, uh, even even script writing has very specific stringent uh, formatting, right? Like he mentions, like, you know, if my cover page doesn't look right, they may reject it out of hand. And and that's a reality of it is is that the way that you format stuff um you know, outside of how how well you wrote, whatever your concept is you wrote, like the actual technical element of it, which is putting it together in the right way, is important and says, you know, it, cl it colors whatever the piece that you've written. So if you have something poorly formatted, it could be great, but with because there's such a deluge of ideas and scripts out there, if, if, you're, if it doesn't even look right, they're, they're going, other people, real people will reject it. And so I think, I think, at least from a technical level, that would be a good thing to know that you are at least, you know, putting the words on the paper the right way. I mean, sure. But even beyond that, the next level about honing your craft is understanding what feedback to take and what feedback not to. Yeah. And so, like, even if it's not great feedback, understanding that as you go forward, that it's not great feedback is so worthwhile. Like every every thing that you learn at any especially at the beginning of a stage of kind of trying to hone a craft. Man, uh, it is it is invaluable. And and yeah, I know, Brian, you've been a part of magic competitions, uh, uh, certainly in your in your younger days. I was part of sketch comedy competitions. We have got you paid. Rich. Have you paid to enter those competitions historically? You you pay uh, to to go to the convention. And so 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 you already have uh, some kind of sunk cost. And then you certainly fear getting on stage and sucking. Sure. And so so th th there are stakes, but there's uh, not a direct fee, basically. Uh, co correct. But I sure. do think there is value to a commitment device, because think about this, like he says, he's got a script in his drawer, mm -hmm. and wants to know if you send it, I'll tell you this much, if you don't enter it in the contest, and if you don't put a hundred something dollars on the line, you have no incentive to say, is this formatted correctly? Uh, what are the sure. things that, it will that are wrong with drawer. this? Whereas, whereas like once you put money on the line, that commitment device will cause you to say like, okay, well, if I'm going to spend a hundred dollars for feedback, I don't want to get called out on technical fouls. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to make sure it's formatted correctly. And guess what? You're learning. So, so the, the mere fact that you put money on the line causes you to commit to be like, not going to, not today, Satan, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to get real good uh, opinions, or I'm going to decide that yeah, I'm going to put myself in a position where if anybody doesn't love this, I know that they're the ones who have a problem, not me. Yeah. And uh, I, I think there's value to that. Yeah, we were part. So uh, the, the sketch comedy uh, troupe went out to uh, Chicago. So there was certainly I mean, uh, I don't know if we paid to get into or paid to submit. We probably paid to submit because uh, most comedy festivals you do pay to submit. But we certainly did pay as 20 somethings with no money uh, to fly out to uh, from New York City to Chicago. And we performed at uh, this like late night uh, thing that was like a competition where we had judges and the judges would uh, give us like live on stage feedback. So it was kind of like a reality show. 
and we crushed with the audience and then just got decimated by the judges wow. on stage. Uh, uh, and it was like, uh, it was one of our best sketches that, but it involved like random out of nowhere singing. That was like, we thought it was kind of funny that none of us were professional singers, but the subject matter was so silly and it was like a musical from out of nowhere. So we felt it could kind of carry, but looking back on that feedback, it probably it was good feedback, but like, man, did it suck to get it while there was a hot light on you and you're in your early 20s and you were filled with all of those hormones and pride and everything yeah. like it sucked. And I'm very glad it happened yeah. because it, it is uh, forever. I just know nothing's really going to be as bad as that. <laughs> nothing's going to be as bad as like going up in front of a bunch of strangers them cheering for you, winning the crowd, then having an authority step out and explain, no, that was a bad sketch. And then the audience is just dead. It's like the, <laughs> the guy like stripped the audience's love from us and then dismissed us off the stage. And then we're like, all right, well, I guess we're going to fly back to New York tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, anyway, see you later. <laughs> but yeah. It was uh, it was it was it was a, an important experience, though. Yeah, those moments are not great, but almost always there's real value that comes from them. I've told the story of having somebody throw fruit at my stage, and I was like, why did that happen? And I realized, um, and I had a long time to think about it. I had a five-hour drive with, with – a long fruit shower. Uh, yeah. I, I had five hours of driving in, in the mountains of West Virginia where I couldn't even get radio. This is pre-internet, pre-smartphone. Uh, so I had nothing but to – Think about why did they hate my show so much? And then uh, out on the other side, I came out with a very strong resolve to never again do a show where the audience was not effectively primed to know that what they were getting into. Because very clearly, the answer was that they thought they were seeing a traditional stage illusion magic show. Mm -hmm. And instead, they got this subverted you know, angry energy against tr cruise ship tricky men. And, um, uh, and that was not what they were primed to expect. Sure. And so, uh, from that, you know, I put together, I immediately went and put together pre-show videos and intro video. And, and, uh, I decided to take music cues out of the hands of tech because they always screwed them up and it always made me look bad. And, uh, there was a drive out of that misery that fueled a decade of success in the college market because everything was to a chrome-like polish because I trusted nobody but myself on everything. Yeah, and I think going back to, to what you guys mentioned, you know, the the amount of money is cosm cosmically small, and the stakes are smaller than than you know, kind of your both of you your anecdotes here, getting fruit thrown at you on stage or doing a rather successful sketch and then kind of being shot down. This script screenwriting contest is surely lower stakes than that. Yeah, I guess the the question he's 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 really asking is, mm -hmm. uh, do you do you sign up to raise the stakes, knowing that that you're just going to spend money just so that you could be more frustrated, and and that's a counterintuitive thing to do. But I would say maybe maybe you do maybe and and yes, I, many of these things are scammed, and maybe the vice is not garbage, but the stakes. Or maybe the advice is garbage, but the stakes are not garbage, right? I, I have known a lot of people, smart, creative, amazing people who have outthought stupid scams that would involve them creatively extending themselves beyond their comfort zone. Uh, they have spotted it. Man, oh, clearly, look. And I'll tell you what, even more, when you Google – the people who started its names, they used to be working at this other thing. Oh, my God. Can you believe they actually used to work with these people? Oh, wow. Good thing I didn't spend my $40. And then that's it. Congratulations. You won the snooping game as to whether or not you should submit. Now, whether or not you do will have no bearing on you actually crossing the threshold that you need to, which is I'm willing to take risks. I'm willing to uh, theoretically put $40 in the hand of a scammer if, if it means that I am extending myself and I am getting my art out there because that's what this world is. This world is constantly going to people that you should not trust. And, they're, uh, and, and 
if you think that that problem is is interesting, wait till what wait till the money gets bigger, the fame, the possible fame gets bigger. Uh, wait until there's there these things are not a decision that you can make in your underwear on a web portal, but rather extend months and months and months and months of your life. Uh, wait until uh, somebody is, asks you if you want to come out and dance on a reality dance show competition. <laughs> and you I'm, sit there and you think that everything in you doesn't want to do this at all. But really, at your heart of hearts, the only reason you're saying no is because you're afraid. And the moment you realize that you're afraid and then that, that that's the exact reason you should do it. Uh, look, man, raise the stakes. I, I, I think there's a lot of good that comes from that. I would say go for it. Uh, uh, but then again, I think the the cost of making mistakes the cost of you literally lighting that sixty dollars on fire especially at this phase of where you're going trying to get to where you're going is well worth it if it means that you took you took a concrete step forward yeah so i hope that helped ken uh brian last weekend or this past weekend you went to vidcon the big youtube uh, content creation conven- convention conference. Yeah. How was uh, that? T- 10th anniversary. Uh, I'd heard about it for a long time. I knew that uh, like 20, 25,000 people showed up at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I had always asked people who went to VidCon like, uh, hey, what's the uh, uh, what's the takeaway? Do you do a lot of business out there? And they are like, well, not so much. But if you've never experienced, you know, connecting with your fans or feeling uh, recognized and famous, it's pretty great. And I was like, well, I mean, I tour with the stage show, so I've experienced that a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I, I never went, but my 11 year old wanted to go as a fan. And I was like, well, if I'm going to go, then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do the dad experience. But uh, sure. let me reach out and see if uh, what opportunities there are. And uh, <laughs> uh, fun fact, my old boss from Revision 3 is is running the show. Jim and Lauterbach, so, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, uh, I, I made it clear. It's like, hey, man, I'm doing this for my daughter, but if there's anything I could do, and there wasn't really a natural fit, especially because it was so late in the game, yeah. to plug me in, although I would love, I'm going to reach out to him immediately and volunteer my services and talks for whatever he wants to plug me into next yeah. year. Because um, of the you had a good time then. two and a half days, um, I spent most of it just, being super dad to Josie, I, but I went to maybe like three or four panels or presentations mm-hmm. and they, they were much more valuable than I would have expected going into it. I thought it was really worthwhile. I had the opportunity to meet with uh, sponsors and potential sponsors. But one of the things that really stuck out to me is they had a fireside chat with the uh, something, something global content development for Twitter. And it made me think of your friend of mine, Ali Spagnola, mm-hmm. and about how she's crushing it with these mashups that, that she's doing on Twitter. Yeah, you've seen these, Justin, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's like the YouTube series that she then posts, like, the songs themselves on Twitter. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. and Twitter increasingly is is making itself not a conduit to link you to where the stuff is, but instead the destination itself. And to see Ali embrace that, because it used to, like, uh, traditionally I've used Twitter to say, hey, there's a thing over here on this YouTube channel. There's a thing over here on this other place. Mm-hmm. Um, but but Ali has been making sure that these videos are under two minutes long and is able to just have it to where you get the full enjoyment out of it. And the real beauty of Twitter is unlike YouTube, on YouTube, once you post a video, you get one 48-hour window where you show up in the new feed for all your subscribers, assuming the algorithm gives you the blessing. Uh, after that, it would be extraordinary and awful for you to try to get away with posting that video a second time. Whereas, uh, like 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 posting the exact same video for the purpose of showing up in their, their new feed again. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas Twitter, there's no expectation in this fire hose that you're not going to post things multiple times. So as a result, when she has a new one of these videos, she posts it and then she retweets the responses people are giving sure. that in effect posts it all over again. And yeah. uh, I, I think when I looked at it, it was like she she had a half million views on one of her videos in on less, than, less than 24 hours on Twitter. Right. And Twitter's introducing tools to, to monetize your content on there. So the idea mm-hmm. of... Uh, of, of content 
with the intention of just going to live on Twitter is is really engaging, especially because, uh, you know, with that back catalog of, of scam school tricks, you know, all those tricks are kind of primed and ready to be reshot uh, uh, for various reasons, uh, including updating the content. But but they're short mm -hmm. enough that I almost wonder if some kind of like, you know, revisiting all that stuff just for the intention of of putting it and monetizing it on Twitter might not be worth worth doing. Um, but there's 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 a number of steps that need to happen in between them. First of all, like uh, the Twitter Media Studio, I think, is the name of the program that allows you to monetize your content. And sure. th that's all stuff I'll have to learn. But because there's there's a business side, it's like the two minute, 20 second video limit for Twitter. That's for like normies. Like, right. If, if you have a longer thing, you can post a longer thing. You just have to be like a business. Are you, there, there's it's probably through that media suit, but there there is there's a means through that already. And yeah. and I think that's something that I, I hadn't recognized the 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 breadth of real estate that we're sitting on on the YouTube or on the Twitter channel. I mean, it's as big almost as the uh, or, or maybe even your bigger. at Schwood account. Uh, yeah. Uh, Twitter dot com slash Schwood is at at as big i mean i threw a stick for kepler for 20 minutes and got you know twenty thousand views and uh and uh it, it's one of those moments I, that you I, realize I, uh, so, no, go ahead. So, oh well in in the presentation they um they talked about a sponsorship deal they did with uh uh the folks who do we rate dogs right so they oh, oh. Uh, they bring the guy out and uh, the guy says it's not a complicated formula Basically, everyone sends us pictures of dogs. We pick one. We always give it a rating of higher than 10 out of 10. And we say something nice about a dog. And the whole world loves it. And uh, and then uh, Disney came and paid them uh, what I imagine is a, mount, uh, a, a Matterhorn of money for four tweets about Dumbo. One where they rated Dumbo. One where they ask a question like, how would you rate Dumbo? And then two more things. Sure. Um, but... But that idea of, and all you have to do is add those magic three characters, pound AD for hashtag ad, mm -hmm. and then uh, and and then you're legit. Uh, it it in a world where speaking your mind earnestly on Twitter is increasingly a liability and not a benefit. It makes me really interested in looking at it as a platform destination for for outputting uh, content that that we do. Mm -hmm. I I I do look a little side eyed at some of those numbers, or at least some of their metrics, right? Oh, for the number of views. Yeah, because you because Twitter does autoplay videos, which is actually I turned I went in and turned off auto playing video, just because I at some point I was scrolling through my feed and just felt like, with like the new way that they've designed the site and how they prioritize you know videos and gifts and stuff, it felt like a cacophony basically. So I, I so I I think I I wonder. If how how if they're doing the Facebook thing that Facebook got fined like five billion dollars oh, for? Oh, did they? I didn't hear about them getting fined for it by uh, by, uh, by the, fake inflating all of their video views. I, I think that was it, or that might have been the surveillance thing. But that was yeah, that was another thing that they got the FTC fined for. But Facebook has definitely been embarrassed because they've inflated numbers. Yeah, and so like this is like a similar thing with Periscope, right? I mean, I mean, I'm sure all of those views were real. But also, this is Periscope, which is a smaller user base. Well, People and also who they probably come have in never... for a few minutes and then leave. Well, and, not... all, and like uh, 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 your Periscope notifications are a different checkbox on Twitter, and most people maybe have never cared about it or thought about it, and and so that it, it's uh, I don't know. It, it would be. I, I would be interested to see if anything shakes out similarly about those because I mean we've had that with scam nation videos where where you know the short videos we've done do very well but you know they're not monetized they're not the full video they're only a fraction of the thing they're meant to get people to where we've been able to monetize on YouTube right um, and so I don't know I um it would be cool I, I genuinely do like Twitter. I don't like the We Rate Dogs account very much, but <laughs> well, but but again, uh, I certainly like uh, how much money it sounds like they made for four tweets, you know. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but it, that's also like the PewDiePie, uh, like that's a big sure, name sure. account, right? Um, 
So I don't know. It, it would be it would be interesting to look more into that. Were, were there any other topics that you cut a panel of? Uh, yeah. I mean, I saw individual people, which I don't know that there's much value in after things. Although sure. uh, I will say one of the highlights was finding out that Veronica Belmont was there. So I, I guess first time I saw V in like uh, four or five years. Yeah. It's, it's been oh. forever. It was really a delight. Was she doing the Adobe stuff there? Uh, uh, n she was not. She was doing her talk on how to deal with online trolls. Oh, nice. And it was interesting because I was like, oh, uh, she was like, oh, I'm about to go on. And then she immediately texts us in like, but don't come. I don't want you in the audience. I'll be nervous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm like, all right. <laughs> Uh, but it was it was uh, just a joy, and I really look forward to um, moving early to try to be a part of next year. I think I think the VidCon experience there's there's a lot of value in it. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun to connect and meet name the the YouTube ecosystem is so very siloed mm -hmm. that. One of the best things on the planet was to have my 11 year old explain to me how much more famous everybody else was than me. <laughs> and then that gave me an instant in to talk to everybody. And uh, uh, it was it was it was a great collaborative experience that I look forward yeah. to uh, participating next year. It would be cool to set up a convention because we, we go to a lot of we've gone to a lot of conventions and stuff, but sometimes it's kind of by the seat of our pants or whatever. And uh, like especially somewhere at a VidCon where you could do a meetup if you were set up with enough time and give people a lot of notice because i think that's that's the thing that these conventions want you know in return is go and tell people you're going to be here right and because right. a lot of times we just kind of get over there asap that doesn't always and gel with kind of what they want that was that was the only bummer was because i wasn't on the program because i wasn't officially part of it there was no incentives for me to make a lot of noise about me being a vidcon sure. so i really was just just josie's dad at this thing uh, it, it would be fun to make make a bit of a splash uh, next year. Yeah. Uh, alrighty. Well, uh, any any after things picks? I'm trying to think. I feel like I had something. Um... Crawl. Go see crawl. <laughs> Alligators. They want to bite you. My pick is Spider Man Far From Home. I loved it. It might be my favorite Marvel movie. Uh, I am just in love with this this spider-man run the fact that they've gotten two spider-man movies in and they have not even like sniffed the good villains like is is amazing uh, you know I, I compared it on twitter to like the dark knight's big villain being clayface uh <laughs> but they uh they've, they've just captured i mean for for both vulture i mean considering vulture is was kind of a, a threadbare villain to my, at least as a fan, I never really connected much to him. They just invented this amazing, super captivating kind of backstory for Vulture uh, and for the villain in this movie. Oh my God. Is it everything I ever wanted in, in telling that kind of story? Cause I do love that villain and man, was it great. And also uh, not only was that movie really, really great, but it was even, it was so good that by the time I walked out of the theater, it had erased some of the damage that another Marvel movie uh, that came out this year that is an Endgame, which name escapes me, uh, did to one of my favorite, uh, uh, one of my favorite elements of the Marvel universe. It even repaired uh, how they treated that element of the Marvel universe like trash garbage, and at least reestablished how rad they can be. Oh, okay, uh, I okay, I, I got to pick. I finished watching this because we got this as a recommendation on Cord Killers last week or the week before. Uh, it's a New Zealand show that, that Netflix got the rights to, The Casketeers. It's a reality-ish show about a family that runs a, a funeral home. And so you follow, you know, uh, the, these funeral directors as they, you know, gather the bodies and get them prepared for, for funerals. And it's, it's interesting because it is a reality show. So it's a mixture of like, here's act, real footage from the people going and working the funerals and you see the families and you see the crying and you see the reaction and you know you you see a lot a lot of different types of funerals because they they deal with a lot of pacific island um uh funerals so uh tongans and uh maori maori people um you you get to see a lot of that and then there's always a b plot of that is very clearly like uh the reality show uh, you know, massaging of it, right? Like, oh, this uh, this week, 
uh, there was a salesperson in and they showed us lighted caskets. And so we're going to show everyone the caskets with the LED lights on them. And, and they get one. And, oh, isn't that weird? It's got oh, it looks like it's colors. floating. Yeah. Um, and that stuff, it I, I get it. You know, it, it's meant to balance off the very heavy and very real emotional element. Um, but sometimes it's just a little, it's just a little over, over, overly done. But I think, but it was, a, it was very, it's very interesting to see and, and look at the, the way these different cultures deal with death and funerals. Um, but, uh, uh, I, it's, it is good. It's good. And it's kind of an easy, quick watch. I think the 12 se two seasons and it's like 12 or 14 episodes. So, uh, it's 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 really neat. The Casketeers. Cool. On Netflix. Nice. Hmm. Uh, well, that's going to do it here for us at After Things. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks for joining me, Brian and Justin. Uh, finally, for, for the first time, we all got together. <laughs> it's, been yep. it's been after. Goddamn right. <laughs> <laughs> Should add a fourth person. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Seems a little crowded. It's <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, thank you everybody for listening to the stream. We'll be back in a few hours with Cord Killers. You, are you streaming again today, Justin? No, no more streaming today. But man, do I got a humdinger of a day tomorrow? So you'll see a lot of me streaming tomorrow. Yeah. You, are you are you doing DTNS tomorrow too? Doing DTNS. I'm doing a, a spot fill in for the Angry Chicken. Oh wow. Uh, uh, then uh, morning stream, of course. And then I'm also recording an interview with uh, Dave Leventhal for the Q2 fundraising numbers. Wow. Big. Presidential candidates. Yeah, big day. What a big raise. I don't know. We'll find <laughs> out. All righty. Well, we'll be back uh, in a little bit with Court Killers. Justin will be back tomorrow. Thank you guys for watching. 